Welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. This week, we're going to start with the first in a two-part series about leaving the Air Force. Not exactly something that most of our audience is probably thinking about, which is exactly why we're having it. This is one of those conversations that, you know, irrespective of whatever rank you achieve, no matter how high you go, no matter how long you serve, the Air Force will ask you to leave at some point, every single one of us. Yet, I think we spend so much time and energy focusing on how to get in, which is great. And that's the point of this podcast, and we get that. But you need to be paying attention to that exit strategy because it's going to happen. Just as much as death is going to happen, and it's a good idea for you to have that conversation with those you love, so is separation from the Air Force at some point. And I'll admit completely, I have not given this stuff any second thought at all, but we have a very special guest who has gone through this process twice. Colin, why don't you introduce yourself? (laughs) Hello, I am Captain Colin Slade, (laughs) and unlike death, (laughs) which hopefully you only do once, (laughs) I have managed to separate from the Air Force, not once, but twice. Yes, and that is why we thought this is a great opportunity to bring to you, our audience, some stuff that you need to be thinking about. Yes, maybe you are a cadet in your second year of ROTC and you're thinking to yourself, this is so far away. And I would be like them. This is far away from me right now. I have active duty service commitments. I'm kind of stuck, gratefully so. But at the same time, everyone that I've seen go through this process has always said, I should have been thinking about this sooner. We have all got something to learn. We've all got some knowledge to gain here. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to bring you this episode. We're going to talk about what it means and how to get out. In this episode, we're going to go into the actual mechanics, the, you know, what Air Force instruction guides this, the timing, those sorts of things. In our next episode that we'll push out next week, we'll talk more about the, the feels, the why would you do this? Everyone's on a different path, and we need to be aware of that. And so that's what we'll do in our next episode. But for this one, we're going to sit at the foot of a master, someone who's gone beyond the grave and come back multiple times. (laughs) I I use that analogy because, and I know you're going to talk about this, Colin, but if you're wearing the uniform, no one around you knows how this process works. It's kind of like death. It's like walking into a room full of living people and saying, what is death like? We don't know. So in this situation, we do. So Colin, what, what, I don't even know. How do we, how does this happen? Take me there. Yeah. Well, let's start from the beginning, which is a very good place to start. What does the Air Force instruction have to say about separations and retirements? So first of all, all of this is governed by Air Force instruction 363207, which talks about both the voluntary and involuntary separations process, including retirements. So it is a typical AFI. It's very dry, but it is in your best interest to look over the instruction and become familiar with the terminology and circumstances that govern both separation and retirement. So that's where I want to start, Reed. Let's actually talk about some of the useful terminology uh, before we uh, move forward in our discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think I've already messed it up. So why don't you start and I'll take the next one and we'll go down the list. Sure. So the first one that we need to understand is the the term separation. This is kind of a catch-all term that includes discharge in any form, release from active duty. It also includes your transfer to a reserve component if you're leaving active duty service. It is important that you do not confuse separation from retirement for various reasons. Yeah, retirement is a different thing. So retirement is defined by 
U.S. Code 42, it allows for the retirement of commissioned officers that are older than 64 and or have completed 20 years of service. Uh, these officers retain certain benefits, pension, and medical, but they're also subject to recall to active duty should that be required. Yeah, that's an important distinction to make in that if you are a retired officer, you're still on the books, as it were. And if the nation goes to war or finds some other reason to reactivate its retired officers, it is within the rights of the Air Force to do that. And even if it's not in a time of war, in a time of need, they can also make that an option. We've seen that lately with pilot positions that are going unfilled, mostly desk jobs like at the Pentagon and headquarters and things like that. I know right now there's a program for eligible colonels to come back into active duty to fill those positions. So another term that encapsulates both separation and retirement that you'll hear thrown around quite a bit but is not in the AFI is transition. Transition refers to the idea of you leaving active service or leaving the, the Guard or Reserve and moving into whatever comes next. And arguably, you could say that one is always transitioning. All right, the next thing we need to talk about is discharge. Everyone who separates or retires is discharged. It's a category of how that occurs. So whether you're separating or retiring, every officer will receive one of three types. So honorable discharge, this is the norm, this is the overwhelming majority, but it's also the highest level in this tiered system. The next is under honorable conditions or a general discharge. It's not quite honorable, but it's still okay in light of the third category of discharge, which is discharge under other than honorable conditions. This is not good, and it's usually the result of some misconduct, violation of the UCMJ, something of that nature. Uh, this type of discharge can have a significant impact on your life. You can't even get a job in most places if you've been a member of the military and were discharged in other than honorable conditions. That is like a go, no go criteria for a lot of employers. Right. And the character of your discharge will not only impact those other uh, areas of your life, but your qualification for the, the benefits that you can receive as a veteran of the armed forces. That is a huge topic that I would love to talk about, but we just don't have time here. So we'll put a pin in that one and discuss it another time. Yeah, absolutely. We also need to understand the term active duty service commitment or ADSC, which is a period of active duty that an officer must complete before they are allowed to voluntarily separate from the armed services. ADSCs are dependent on a number of things, such as the career field that you go into. For example, rated officers have a 10-year ADFC after they complete their flying training, where non-rated serve an ADSC of four or five years, depending on their commission source. You incur an ADSC from PCSing or even from participating in some sort of education program, such as the Air Force Institute of Technology or using tuition assistance. You need to keep track of your ADSC. It is very important to your ability to separate and or retire. Yep. The internship that I'm participating in, I incurred a six-year active duty service commitment, three years here in the program, and then a three-year follow-on. So when you're at you know the five to seven year point making another six year commitment, you need to put that in the calculus when you're thinking about this kind of stuff. Last thing we're going to talk about that you need to be aware of is the military service obligation. Now this is different than an active duty service commitment. This is a period of time that a member must serve in the regular or reserve component of the armed forces. This is all dictated by Title 10 of the U.S. Code. Any part of such service that is not active duty or that is active duty for training shall be performed in a reserve component. This is typically eight years. So what this means, let's pick a traditional CE officer, Colin, like someone I may know, right? You 
committed to the Air Force, you incurred a four-year active duty service commitment and an eight-year military service obligation. You did your first assignment right around the four-year mark when you were eligible to separate. You separated, but you transitioned, we use that word there, to the inactive ready reserve for a period of up to four years. So you were still on the books. Yes, because at that point, I had not yet completed my MSO, my military service obligation. I still had four more years left in the IRR. Or if I had gone into a active reserve status where I was participating in drill with the Guard or Reserve, that could have also gone toward my MSO. Okay, so those are a bunch of definitions. They're going to be useful as we go forward. But let's start getting into the, okay, you, for whatever reason, time has come and separation becomes something that you plan on as a member. Let's start there. Yeah, so we're going to do this from the perspective of active duty, knowing that leaving the guard or reserve is very similar, but has some minor nuances. So the best way I think to do this is to follow the timeline of a typical Air Force officer career. But please note that this will not include any discussion around, like you said, read the wide variety of the feels, the personal and professional reasons for voluntarily transitioning. But we're also not going to talk about the involuntary separation, such as administrative discharge for failing to meet standards, the various force shaping programs, medical evaluation boards, or even criminal convictions. Yeah, that would be a lot. There's a whole lot going on there. All very important stuff that we need to address at some point, but just don't have the, the bandwidth for this particular episode. All right. So you commission, you are on active duty, Day one, the clock begins against your active duty service commitment and your military service obligation. Yeah, so we call that EAD or extended active duty. Once you EAD or enter active duty service, your ADSC and your MSO immediately begin to count down. Now, remember, ADSC and MSO are not the same thing, but they start at the same point. Your ADSC will change as we highlighted based on various things. You need to keep an eye on it. You need to be aware of when you are eligible to apply for separation or retirement. That is your responsibility. Nobody's gonna do it for you. As a commission officer, you have the opportunity, so long as you continue to serve honorably, to serve almost indefinitely. There are no periods of, of enlistment or anything like that. You don't have to take the oath over and over and over again. But if you're not tracking your ADSC, you may miss some opportunities that you didn't know were there. Or likewise, when you do feel that the time is right for you to separate, you may not be able to. Okay, so we got that baseline. You've decided that it's time to separate or you've reached retirement. What is like the first thing you have to do? You have to talk to your commander. That is step one. You cannot get around it. The primary reason for this is because the commander must concur on your application to separate or retire. So we're not talking, you should talk to your leadership just because it's almost always a good idea to talk to your leadership. No, it's actually like on the books required. Yes, it is step one in the AFI that when you decide you want to apply for separation, you must go talk to your commander. Okay. How did those conversations go since you've done them twice now? <laughs> the, so the first time was a little bit nerve wracking, uh, I must say, because my situation was that I had been offered a spot at AFIT. I was headed toward the GEM program. I was going to go be a, a student for 18 months and it was going to be awesome. But over the course of a long Christmas break, had lots of conversations with my wife. Also, by the way, during that time, I was notified that I would be deploying for the second time. 
And those conversations between me and my wife yielded that it was time for us to move on from active duty. So I came back from Christmas vacation to talk to my commander, what he thought was going to be about the deployment, but I let him know that I was going to separate as soon as my deployment ended. He was not prepared for that. I mean, he handled it well, but he was really surprised. Well, and like we talked about, you know, at the top of this episode, this is unknown territory for commanders. Not having members separate, but the separation, like they've not done it. So that's got to be a really hard place, right? To how do you counsel, mentor, give advice to someone on something you've never even done? Yeah, absolutely. Everywhere you go in the Air Force, where, where you are surrounded by people who are wearing the uniform, they don't know what it's like to separate your transition, unless they're somebody like me who has found a way to do it multiple times. But there are some things that are in place to help through this process, right? And the first one we're going to talk about is TAP. Why don't you walk us through what TAP is? Yep. TAP is the Transition Assistance Program. This is a congressional requirement. You cannot get out of it. Believe me, I've tried twice, but it exists to make sure that members of the military who in many circumstances have never done anything else professionally in their life are prepared for that transition. It is to assist them through the transition, hence the name, right? You can go through TAP whenever or wherever it's offered. You know, for example, if you want to take a PTDY to some destination location, you can do that. So long as you are willing to pay for the travel and lodging there, your commander may approve the PTDY to that location. So know that that is something that is available to you at any point. You can take TAP multiple times if you feel like it. Yeah, so folks that I know that have separated and retired, many of them had gone through it multiple times. So I, you know, I knew that that was an option. And we're not going to get into all the details of TAP because there's quite a bit in there, but I've heard a lot of really good things about it. I remember commander I worked for that was going through it. Like you tried to get out of it, did the whole, hey, I'm an 06, don't you know who I am kind of thing. Tried to not have to take it, but in the end ended up appreciating the information they received. Yeah, it's like many things where you'll get out of it what you put into it. But like you said, it's too big to talk about here. So we'll put a pin in that one as well and address it specifically another time. Yeah, but it's also good for folks to know it when you hear, oh, so-and-so is going to tap. Like, like that's, that's what's going on. They're trying to get information on this stuff. Yeah, and it does not necessarily mean that they are separating right then. It just means they're getting information. They're being proactive about preparing themselves for the transition. Because everybody should. Yeah. All right. So you've signed up for TAP. Maybe you've even gone. What happens next? So so you've made that decision like we've been talking about. You are prepared to separate or retire. 180 days prior to the day that you have selected for separation or retirement, that is when you are allowed to first, quote, press the button or, quote, drop papers. Yeah, those are definitely the phrases you hear. So 180 days out is the window? That is the window. That is when you can go into virtual MPF and push the button. But recognize that in order to do that, your ADSC must be complete before that date of separation that you select. Okay, so there again, you got to be aware it doesn't matter what things you've got on the back end. Those things have to be in place before you can start the process. Absolutely. And commanders have a responsibility to review that and approve it. The, the very first thing that happens once you've pushed that button is your commander will get a, an email notification and they'll have to go in and verify and approve. Got it. And that for both retirement and separation. Correct. Got it. Okay. And... I'm, I'm guessing after that, there's a series of events that start happening once that process has started to roll. Absolutely. Yep. Once you push that button and the commander approves it, that is the trigger for everything that comes next. The first thing that's going to happen is that a out-processing checklist is going to get posted to you 
in virtual MPF in a module called virtual out processing or VOP. Okay. So for those of our audience who may or may not know, every time you leave a unit and every time you go to a unit, you have to process either in or out. If you're joining a unit, it's in processing. If you're leaving a unit, it's out processing. Traditionally, this is like a five to seven page go visit everyone on base, give them a copy of your orders, check in kind of thing. And it's all relatively good stuff, right? When you're leaving a unit, you want to make sure you're not taking any equipment you shouldn't. You want to make sure that every responsibility that you had is tied up. Medically, you're qualified. All that. So it's just basically getting all your ducks in a row prior to leaving. When you're gained at a new unit, it's very similar stuff, right? You need to be gained. Your records need to be there. They need to make sure that you're real, that you're present, all that kind of stuff. How big is this list? I'm guessing this is like the biggest out-processing list ever. Yeah, it's pretty significant. We certainly can't cover all of the things that are listed there, but the vast majority of it is pretty innocuous. I mean, for example, they want you to make sure that if you are responsible for any enlisted airmen's EPR, that you do that, right? Sure. And that's going to be on any in or out processing checklist. Or if you have an official passport that you turn that back in. Okay. So uh, there's a couple more steps. Uh, That makes sense. I just, when you said there's a checklist, I thought, oh my gosh, Uh, you know, this is probably like a, a binder checklist size, you know, just. It can be, especially if you're retiring. Okay. It's a heavy lift to get through all of these things. What are the big ones? that you think you want to make our audience aware of that they can't sleep on? Because some of these things, you're like, oh, I can take care of that later. But what are the ones they can't sleep on, the big ones? Yeah. So the very first one is that you have to have a pre-separation counseling appointment with someone at the MPF or military personnel flight within the career development section. You have to go do that because you will be assigned someone within that section who's going to be your mentor, your assistant through the out-processing process. You want to make sure that you get that done and taken care of because they're going to be able to help you with many of the other things that come next. Do not miss that appointment. Honestly, the heaviest lift of all of them is the medical slash dental piece of it. Just like it's a very heavy lift medically to get into the Air Force, it is just as much so to get out of it. Why is that? The main reason is that you earn medical benefits, whether separating or retiring because you are a veteran and the armed forces want to make sure that they are doing their due diligence on behalf of you and your service. Sounds good. So the career counselor that's going to help you through the separation process and then the medical, those seems to be kind of like the really big poles in the tent. What are some other things that are on this checklist that folks need to be aware of? Yeah. Other ones that I I want to highlight here, they're not a heavy lift, but there's definitely something that you want to be thinking about. First of all is having a conversation with the in-service recruiter. In-service recruiters are the people who help someone who is already in the service stay serving in some sort of capacity, either the guard or reserve. Now, there are different recruiters for the reserve and the guard, but they're both called in-service recruiters. They will help you consider all of the different possibilities that are available to you in either component, whether traditional guard or reserve, IMA, Individual Mobilization Augmentee, AGR, Active Guard Reserve, all of these different things, they will help you work through those various options if you want to keep serving. Now, do you get the contact info for this person at TAP? Do you get it from your counselor? Because I know people that even before they start thinking about separation or retirement or other options, they'll go talk to an in-service recruiter because that's part of their calculus, right? If they're thinking about getting out, but they still want to have some hand in it, that's one thing they can still do. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. So the contact information is going to be based on where you're located. You'll have an in-service recruiter there at your base or assigned to service your base. And you can get it through the out-processing checklist. They will also show up to TAP. They will be there in person or send a representative to 
talk about some of those options while you are there. So there are many ways that you'll get in touch and be introduced to the in-service recruiters. Cool. Thanks. Then another one that I want to highlight here is the education center. These are the, and, and the, and the counselors that work there. These are the folks that will help you with your educational benefits, especially the GI bill. The GI bill is a hugely important benefit that you want to make sure you have a plan for that you have a plan for whether that you are going to use it yourself or if you're going to transfer the benefit to your dependents. Now, if you want to transfer the benefit, you have to have at least seven years of total federal commission service. Again, really important to pay attention to those dates. Yeah. The GI bill is such an important benefit that you do not want to neglect that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So after that, then it seems like it's kind of the typical move stuff. Well, I guess we can't even say most often. Often a move is associated with a retirement or separation, but sometimes people are going to stay in place, but that that's kind of the next step, right? Yep. So you're going to want to schedule an appointment with TMO or the traffic management office as soon as you can. And if you have the ability try to keep your separation and retirement away from the PCS season because that's just going to make it more difficult for you to schedule the pickup and delivery of your household goods. Yeah. If you're going to be moving, you know, cross country and you're also fighting, I don't know, 30 to 40 to 50,000 members of the DOD who are PCSing in the same season, just pick a different time if you can. Yep. And then the final piece of this is you have to review your records. You should be doing this anyway, whether you're separating or not, but it becomes especially important as you are leaving the service because the information that is in your records is what is going to get reflected on your DD-214 or Certificate of Release or Discharge. Now we mentioned earlier those various different discharges, the levels that you can get and how they will affect your benefits. All of that comes from your records and what's found there. If your records are incomplete or inaccurate, it could change the disposition of your discharge. Yeah. I don't know a whole lot about this process, but I know the DD-214 is a really big deal. That, that's an important document. So it's critical that you spend some time to review your records. And, then, and part of that is that pre-separation counseling that you, that you do with the MPF. They will help you to review your records. But you need to own a big part of that responsibility. Yeah. And like you said, Colin, this applies anyway. You should be doing this regularly. But I can kind of see you're going to kind of cement things, if you will, right? Like while you're in, the cement isn't quite set right? You've always got an avenue to kind of get stuff addressed. But as soon as you punch, like things kind of settle. Yeah. And it's a pretty arduous process to get a DD-214 corrected if that's necessary. Can be done, but it much easier to do it, as you said, when things are still wet long before they dry. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So got your DD-214. I've heard them called the DD-214 blanket. I've even seen them made into blankets. Those are epic. What next? You're out. You're in the free world. You, you can grow your hair and a beard or, or like, what's the plan? Well, you're not out yet. Oh. You still have some things that you need to do at the same time as you are working the out processing process. Okay. So the biggest part of that is that you are preparing for whatever comes next, that you are lining up whatever it is that you're going to do, be it a move into a different career, whether government or corporate or some other thing, maybe start your own business. Or just nothing. <laughs> you're going to retire, wear your retired hat, go to the commissary once a month. Um, I, I don't think it works sorry. that way. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm... You're talking about your own dream, but that is different from the typical career. Because think about it. 
if you are separating after your first initial ADSC, which is four or five years, you're still a very young person. You have a lot of life left to live and you need to have something to do, whether it's an actual job to begin with or further education toward a job that you want to do, you're gonna have to live. And it takes employment to earn a paycheck in order to live, right? Yeah, and a minority of officers are actually gonna reach that retirement eligibility anyway. Sorry, I, I'm just waxing excited and poetic about the possibility, it sounds lovely. Yeah, and likewise for those who retire, after 20 years of service, say you came in when you were 24, well, you're now 44. And the normal civilian equivalent of a retirement age is around 65, 66, 67, right? So you've got another 20 years plus of another career that that's coming for you, unless you have found some way while you were serving to become independently wealthy, which is very rare. Yeah, basically not going to happen. I can have my dreams. All right, I'm officially squashed. <laughs> Get back to reality. Okay, so you, yeah, finding the next thing. It is critical. And the way you're going to do that, depending on the path that you choose, is networking and doing some sort of hunting for either a job or educational program. So this is the time for you to write or update your resume. and. Speaking from experience, the civilian world out there loves numbers and accomplishments. Thankfully so. You as an officer should have a series of OPRs that have all of those numbers and accomplishments on there. Make sure that they get onto your resume, but in such a way that layperson civilian can understand it. Take all the jargon out. Yeah. I've heard, you know, in various podcasts and things I've read online that the transition from your officer performance report to a resume is not clean and not easy, that it, it takes people with knowledge and experience to kind of help you navigate through that. So you're probably going to need somebody to help you through that. Have you worked with teams or organizations to kind of help you navigate this challenging world? Yeah, and that's part of the reason for TAP, the Transition Assistance Program. They will help you to create or update your resume. But you should also be working with your mentors, especially people who have already passed through this transition before. Talk to them about how they wrote their resume to help them get the job or career that they are in. You can also work with a recruiter. There are plenty of recruiters out there who focus specifically on military officers. They have the experience and knowledge of translating your experience into something that makes sense to the civilian world. Nice. So along with this job hunt that you're going on, you're still meeting other deadlines. I mean, the date's coming, right? The clock is running. Time is an unforgiving master. What's the next big deadline that will hit you whether you're ready or not. Yeah, so 60 days out from your separation, that is the point at which you should have your order to separate. Just like you need orders to get into the Air Force, you need orders to get out. Now, this is pretty funny because we are recording this on July 3rd. I separated from active duty the second time on July 1st, and I still don't have my separation orders. That's a nuancey thing, but the typical way things happen is that you'll receive your orders no later than 60 days out from your data separation. Yeah, and we'll just blame COVID on this one. I mean, that's kind of going to be like big hand, small map of 2020. <laughs> just COVID happened here. So you've got your separation orders. What are some other things that you're, you know, those last few things that you're trying to think about is that date is coming? Yeah, the big one here is deciding what to do with any leave that you have saved up. You have multiple different options of what to do with it, but definitely some are better than others. So what can you do with your leave? You can just use it like regular leave. You can just take some time off during this process and it will be fine. It will give you the opportunity to rest and recuperate uh, during this very arduous experience. But I highly recommend that you don't do it, and I'll explain why. 
because you have other options. One is to sell any accrued leave back to the Air Force. You can sell back up to 60 days across an entire career. So anytime you leave active duty, you have this opportunity to sell one day of leave back for one thirtieth of your base salary at the time. So if you have 30 days of leave built up, you can get one full month essentially of your base salary. However, that will be taxed at a rate of 22% plus any state taxes based on where you're stationed and or where you pay your state taxes to. And this is paid to you after you separate or retire. What is terminal leave? Is that a separate category of leave? I've heard people say, oh, I'm on terminal leave. What is that kind of leave? Yeah, so that this is your third option and the one that I would recommend if you can make it work. Terminal leave is where you can take any leave that you have saved up and backdate from your date of separation to that many days of leave and start your next thing at that point. So say you have 60 days of leave saved up, 60 days prior to your official date of separation, you start terminal leave and that is the first point at which you can start your next thing. You can take a, another job and they can start paying you. Even though you are still on orders with the Air Force, you can be receiving a second paycheck. Pretty awesome, right? Okay, so that makes sense. So that's traditionally how I see people use it. I, I hear most often people using terminal leave instead of just the other two options. Well, yeah. And part of that is that if you have a large amount of terminal leave saved up, you get those two paychecks potentially for a much longer time. So you can kind of double dip, if you will. Being on terminal leave, you still collect your housing allowance and your basic allowance for subsistence, both of which are non-taxable. The big difference from selling back your leave where you don't get BAH and BAS and the leave that you sell back is taxed at a higher rate. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. So here it comes, your date of separation. We're like in the window, a couple days out, what's happening next? Yeah. So one day prior to your data separation, you've completed all of the out processing checklist items. You have your next thing lined up, hopefully, whether it's a job or educational program, or maybe you're starting your own business. One day prior to your DOS is your final out with the MPF. This is where you go and sit down with that career counselor and they make sure that you have completed everything that you're supposed to and you're ready to leave the Air Force. I'm guessing that appointment's in uniform. It is in uniform. You must shave and your hair must be in regs. Got it. Okay. So I can't grow a beard yet, even if I'm terminal leave. Okay. All right. Well, sorry, I should clarify. Your final out will either be the day before your data separation or the start of your terminal leave. Oh, okay. All right. That makes sense. So if you are on terminal leave, that means that you have already finaled out. And yes, you can grow a beard during your terminal leave. In fact, you should. I know you have. Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> All right. So date of separation. There it is. Congratulations. You've made it. Yeah. It's your next birthday, if you will. The day you became a Mr. or a Mrs., right? Yep. So the date of separation is your last day in the Air Force or at least on active duty. If you are transitioning into the Guard or Reserve, that will happen on the next day. You will be gained to the Air Reserve component in whatever capacity. If you can manage to avoid a break in service, you should do that. And your in-service recruiter is going to be able to help you with that. If you're intending to continue to serve in some capacity, right? That is correct. Yeah. Okay. And you will receive your final paycheck in the mail. It is not paid to you direct deposit. It will be some number of weeks after your data separation, as well as your DD-214 will be posted to you within virtual MPF at some point after you separate. And do you still retain access to that? I know this is so juvenile, but like when you leave, do you like hand in your CAC? You do. 
wow, so how do you get access to MPF to get that document? So part of the TAP class and out processing is setting up your accounts so that you can sign into MyPERS and virtual MPF without a CAC. Got it. Okay. So that you can still access all those records, which are now cemented. Remember, we kind of talked about that earlier. Yep. Got it. Okay. Woo. That's quite the checklist. Right? Yeah. I can totally see why people counsel you to pay attention to stuff early because this seems like one of those things you don't want to just build the airplane while you're flying it. You kind of want to know that there's a plan ahead of time. Yeah. I mean, you're going to separate or retire from the Air Force anyway. It's going to happen. But there are things that you can proactively do to make the process much more smooth. Awesome. Well, Colin, I'm really glad that you're around zombie zombie to come back from the dead to tell us how this all works so that we can make our audience a little bit more informed. I know for one, I'll keep it, you know, back burner for me, but it's good to have the knowledge. And for our audience, like we've already said, this is the first in a two-part series where we're exploring the idea of separating. It's going to happen. It's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to me. It's going to happen to the chief of staff. No matter how long you're in, you're going to have to get out at some point. And in order to make sure you achieve your goals, you kind of have to know how this process works. This week, we covered the ins and outs, the details, if you will, the nuts and bolts of the mechanics. Next week, we're going to talk about the feels, the why, and when folks know it's time to hang up the jersey. Yeah, absolutely. And that, honestly, is a tough conversation. I'm really looking forward to having it with you, Reed, and sharing uh, some of my lessons learned uh, over the, the course of my two separations from the Air Force, uh, as well as uh, pointing you to some, some resources and things that uh, are going to help you make this transition process that much easier on you. Yeah, looking forward to it. We want to thank our audience for joining us today. That will conclude this week's episode of Commission Ed. Thank you for listening to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. The views and opinions of the authors expressed herein do not state or reflect those of the government and shall not be used for advertising or product endorsement purposes. Mention of any specific commercial products, process, or service by trade name, trademark, manufacturer, or otherwise does not necessarily constitute nor imply its endorsement, recommendation, or favoring by the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement.